The year was 1995. I was in the sixth grade and little did I know, but the trajectory of my entire life was about to change. That was actually the year that I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, come to think of it. But that is not the traumatic event of which I am referring. No, I'm in fact speaking of Magic the Gathering. The combination of art, fantasy, and tabletop gaming captured me then and never let go. So when I heard that Magic and Warhammer were teaming up for these commander decks, an idea was sparked. An idea that 12-year-old me would have loved. Today, we are going to attempt to combine miniatures and cardboard to create the world's first true 3D magic card. Hey everybody, I went down to my local LGS and picked up these new Magic the Gathering 40k Commander decks for a couple of reasons. First of all, Commander frickin' rocks. Second, I wanted to see how the art really displayed from the Warhammer universe on the Magic cards, and I wanted to see how they made the rules from 40k translate into Magic the Gathering mechanics. And while looking through this art, I had an idea. What if we could take the Warhammer art on the Magic cards and make it come to life? Something like a pop-up book like what we had as kids. Instead, it's actual miniatures that we paint up to make the art come to life. My idea is to find some card art that shows a Warhammer model roughly the same scale as our miniatures. And then I'll just hack up the mini and position it just like the card art so it looks like it's jumping right out at you. In hindsight, it would have been way easier to just find a cool looking art battle scene going on and then just pick a model and make it look like it's jumping out of the battle at you. Um, this way I have to have a two scale 32 millimeter model that's exactly that size on the card and that's stupid idea okay it was not my brightest moment but despite myself i did actually find a card that fit my much more difficult to achieve original idea of finding a two scale figure on the card the card nurgle's rot depicts a squad of space marines succumbing to a gassy green virus of some sort and there's a marine right in front succumbing to the virus almost climbing out of the card towards us this will be perfect for us to be able to play with a 3d perspective why am i doing this with my hands the whole time i do not have the nurgle's rot i took an at-home test i'm good Finding all of the right bits from a box of Primaris Intercessors is the easy part. But my positive momentum for this project hits a hard stop when I realize that I'm going to have to hack up each individual part so it's positioned at just the exact same angle as the character in the card art. And if I don't get this part right, it's just going to look like some preschool macaroni art that your mom puts on the fridge instead of actually messing with the perspective and making the card look like it's coming to life. So yeah, this was the exact moment when I realized it would have just been a much easier process if I hacked off a Space Marine as butt cheeks and glued him to any random card showing a battle scene and having him jump out at us. But I've come too far and I'm too much of a stubborn SOB to stop now. So I'm going to keep hacking away at the models and sanding them down until I can get as close as possible to the perfect angles to line up to the card. I decided to deviate a bit from the art and just have his entire right forearm coming out of the card instead of dragging over the ground. This gives us a lot more depth because this arm is now kind of reaching out more towards the viewer instead of just hiding its way back into the two-dimensional original art piece. When I got to cutting and positioning the head, I realized that I'm going to have to do a little bit more work, even though I did find a good Space Marine face with an expression that seems pretty close to the artwork. I need to sculpt an infected horn that's sprouting from the head in the artwork. And at first, my version just mostly looked like a Christmas elf's hat. But once I got the basic shape on, I just let the green stuff dry for about 20 minutes so it was firm and easier to manipulate. And eventually, it started to look pretty close to the artwork. I then rolled a few very tiny green stuff balls and placed them on the head near the base of the horn. These will represent those little weird gooey boobos that so often accompany unexpected horn growth. The only other sculpting I did was his left wrist, so it looks like it's fading into the background to match up with his hand that's grasping at the ground in the background. And now that everything's set for painting, we first need to prime the model black. And I sure can't do this directly on the card, lest I just cover up all of our great background art with black primer. As you might have guessed, I didn't have any of these parts glued down as I was building up this composition. I just used my go-to museum putty to tack everything in place. 
I decided to just tack down all the pieces on a different magic card. That way, as I was priming them, I knew I was hitting all the correct angles so all the black would be covering from any spot that you'd see the pieces on the final card. Super gluing the primed pieces onto the card proved a pretty nerve wracking experience. You really only get one shot at this as super glue will immediately adhere to the cardboard, meaning you have no wiggle room to position the bits once they've been placed. I wasn't entirely happy with the position that the head glued down onto the card, but what was I gonna do, rip everything apart and have to go to the store and spend another 50 bucks on another deck just for another copy of Nurgle's Rot? No, we're gonna try to make it work. But let's just keep moving, get some paint on this thing and see what happens. I'm immediately unsure of what colors to use. I'm matching existing artwork, but I don't have any idea what colors that artist used. And more than likely they were either oils or standard artist acrylics. And I don't use those for miniature painting. I just grab a few blues, a black and a white, and I'm going to get to mixing and see how close I can get. I'm quickly realizing that it doesn't have to be perfect to really look just fine. We often think that we have to match the exact paint or color match anything we want to replicate from any official army paint scheme. But in practice, I found that that's really not the truth of the matter at all. I'm just starting with my darkest shadow and working my way up for each surface of the model. I keep the paint thinned 50-50 with water so it's a thin layer consistency. And I start each brush stroke on the part of the surface I want to keep darker and then end each stroke where I want the most paint to collect. By working this way from the very first layer of paint, I'm building in shadows and mid-tones over our black primer. Another easy trick to help here is to realize that once you've used most of the paint on your brush, don't just go back to the palette to get more. Use that final bit of thin paint that's still on your brush and work it into the areas you want to be darker, like the edges of his shoulder pads. After this darkest layer is applied, I take a look and I'm pretty happy with how the color works with the artwork. If it's close, your eyes are gonna tell you you're just looking at the same color. And now we just need to identify the best way to match the midtones and highlights. With close inspection on the artwork, it appears that the original artist worked up to a more saturated middle blue for the midtones. And then as they get to the brighter and brighter highlights, it's actually desaturating. So we're gonna mix in some white there for our brighter highlights. I'm always adding more paint to my existing color mix. I'm never starting with a brand new color from each layer. This helps keep our transitions natural and smooth. Today's video is brought to us by my friends over at Epic Basing, and their name probably sounds familiar because lately I've been using their basing materials all the time on my videos and my personal army projects. It's crazy how much of a difference awesome basing can make on our models, but hand sculpting basing elements for each individual model I paint just isn't feasible. Plus, my sculpting ability really caps out at about Play-Doh snakes. And this is where Epic Basing steps in. Their bits are easy to use, they're durable, and have realistic quality. And the variety of what they have is amazing. Plus, they're coming out with new stuff all the time. They're just about to release these kitty cats, some palm trees, something called Demon Stone, and even more cool detailed bits like torches, pottery, and battlefield debris. You can purchase resin bits that will be mailed right to your door or purchase the STL files and print as many as you'd like. Check out the link to epicbasing.com down in the video description and the first 100 of you that check out with code EPICLEVELUP will get 13% off your entire order. So now's a good time to do some early holiday shopping for yourself before those codes are all gobbled up. A big thank you to Epic Basing for supporting the channel. Well, for this entire project, I'm just using a size zero sable hair brush, and I'm doing this for two reasons. The first one is that I really don't want to make mistakes as I'm painting next to the edges of where the card meets the model and get paint on the card. And the second reason is the artwork of this card is actually a very realistic kind of paint scheme and I can kind of emulate that by using tiny little stippling and little scratch motions as I build up the highlights to make it feel like it's the same art style as the card itself. 
As I'm to this point in the painting process, I'm actually starting to get a little bit excited. It really hasn't taken much paint on the model for this to start to harmonize with the card art. Each layer seems to meld the art in the model more and more. And in a weird way, this has actually made this kind of middle part of the painting process, which is usually the least fun part for me, the most exciting because I'm always referencing the background art and I'm trying to tweak my approach so it matches closer or helps guide my decisions as I work my way through the model. And I'm starting to notice things in the artwork I didn't see before, like how there's actually two light sources in this piece. There is a standard white light from above and in front of the scene, which is what we use to determine the placement and intensity of our highlights. But there's also a green glow that is reflecting from the noxious gas surrounding the feet of the Marines. At first, I just thought this gas was present around the ground in the artwork. But once I started to notice that there was faint reflections on the armor, I realized that the artist is using this green as a secondary light source. And once I started adding this toxic green on the downward facing armor surfaces, suddenly the piece started to feel like it was working in harmony with the background and not just some tacked on addition. Because the green is already present in the background, it didn't take much to sell the effect on this model. Typically, when I'm trying to paint subtle bounce lights, I feel like I need to push the light pretty far for the audience to see my intention. But with this piece, the faint green was all that was needed. I'm starting to get a little bit of excitement for this project. So before I spoil it by ruining something on the blue armor, I'm gonna call it done and move on to the gold trim. Again, I don't know what colors to use. So I just grab a regular old dark brown, a nice middle yellow golden brown, and then a bright ice yellow for the highlight. The keen eyed of you will notice that some of the shoulder pad trim from the original artwork is showing around the edges of where our bits don't exactly match up perfectly. And this bothered me quite a bit and it kind of reminded me how stupid of an idea was to expect to perfectly match up a 3D object with the 2D art that weren't to the same scale. But regardless, we're gonna continue to move on. But as I did work my way through the paint job, I seemed to notice these imperfections less and less. And this is true of any model we paint. We're harder on ourselves and the imperfections we see, oftentimes others don't. And just like anything in life, if you are focusing on the negative, then the negative is what will surround you. But if you focus on the positive and the little victories that you have, that's gonna give you the momentum into the end of this project and fuel you into the next one. The artist used a strong yellow brown for his gold with a sharp bright yellow for the white light reflections and edge highlights. I make sure to push these pretty hard because it's not until this step that your paint job will actually read to the human eye as metal. I also often find that I lose some of the warmth of gold when I do these kinds of stark highlights. So I like to finish with a final glaze of golden brown back over all of that armor to bring the warmth back. Our final and most important step of this painting process is to paint the Space Marine's face. Now, he is in the midst of agony from the pox that riddles him, so we need to ensure that the eye of the audience is drawn to this face. And even though I want this to be the focal point of the piece, it's still a very atmospheric, dark, and dreary environment, and I'm gonna still wanna start pretty dark and work my way up to brighter colors on the face. As I'm taking my time building up thin layers, focusing on where the highlights would fall on his face, I'm getting excited about what I'd like to do next in this pop-up book style. This whole project is starting to feel like an experiment, an experiment that has potential for growth. Maybe there's something different I'd change entirely. Maybe a totally different project is spurred from this origin, but one way or the other, I'm not regretting trying this at all. 
To me, it feels more than just a painted Warhammer model, more than just an altered art magic card. And that excites me. Not that I'm gonna be the one that comes up with the next thing cool or the next evolution of this, but that one of you will that you'll have an amazing idea that you can bring into creation, whether it's an evolution of what I've done today or something entirely different. To me, what's made this project something that's gonna stick with me for a long time is that it's combining multiple passions that I have all in one project. Miniature painting, Warhammer, magic, what's not to love? At least for me. I mean, maybe you're more of a miniature painting, kittens, and Oreos kind of person. God, I really hope someone comes up with the kittens, Oreos, and miniature painting project. Hey, thanks for hanging out today and sticking around all the way to the end of the video. You know, if I learned nothing else from this experience today, it was just that sometimes taking action and working on that weird idea you had and making it a reality can just totally be worth it. And while you're getting creative at your painting desk, why don't you listen to a podcast while you're there? One about, I don't know, maybe miniature painting? That's right, Trapped Under Plastic is a real miniature painting podcast. And I often forget that many of you don't know it exists. It's a podcast with myself and Miniac, the famous miniature painter. We talk about all sorts of weird things and occasionally even miniature painting. And a massive thank you to all of you that are supporting me over on Patreon. It's because of you that I'm able to go through with these big weird projects like this. So I really appreciate the support. If you wanted to join the Ninjan Dojo for just a couple of bucks a month, check out the link down in the video description below to my Patreon and see the fun rewards you get for joining us over there. I'm going to see you back here again real soon. And sometime between now and then, make sure you find time in your day to slay the gray. Oh, that was a black lotus.